Lesson number five, the declaration of salvation. Last time we looked at how Jesus was willing to humble himself in order to carry out the plan of salvation. Look again at Philippians chapter two. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word, therefore, is an important one. Since Jesus did all the previous, humbling himself by not grasping or making full use of his divine glory and power in order to live and finally die in our place, Jesus was declared to be the Savior of all and will be declared by all as the one who carried out the work of their salvation, whether they have benefited from it or not through belief. Since Jesus was done paying the price of our salvation, he no longer needed to humble himself. The time when he began once again to make full use of his divine power and glory is what we call Jesus' exaltation, literally being lifted up. This is the time when Jesus once again made full use of his heavenly power and glory. When did that begin and what does that include? Jesus' exaltation, his full use of his divine power and glory includes the following. Descended, rose, ascended, seated, and judge. Now let's make sure that we don't think of this as a progression in the sense that each of these things, by each of them, Jesus is gaining more and more of his divine power and glory. No, it was all there immediately with that very first event, Jesus' descent into hell. Now you might be thinking, what? How is descending into hell glorious? Well, let's begin by understanding when Jesus descended into hell. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. As we read through these verses, did you trace the order of the events that are described in these verses? When did Jesus descend into hell according to 1 Peter chapter 3? It was after Jesus became alive. That would have been on Easter Sunday morning. Jesus died on a Friday afternoon and he rose early on Sunday morning. And what exactly was Jesus then doing in hell? Well, Jesus did not descend to hell to give the people there a second chance or to pay for a few sins that he had forgotten to pay for earlier. Remember Jesus' words on the cross, it is finished, not, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. No, Jesus' descent into hell was a declaration of his victory. Look at this passage from Colossians chapter 2, which uses a picture of a triumphant Roman general marching through the streets with his captives chained behind him, being led to their execution. Colossians chapter 2, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus descended to hell on Easter to proclaim his victory over the devil. Imagine the sight in hell as the victorious, victorious Christ marched through the streets of hell declaring that his death was the defeat of the devil's power. After Jesus' descent, Jesus rose from the dead. This took place on the Sunday morning after Jesus' death, which was on Friday. Jesus' resurrection has been celebrated by Christians as Easter ever since. It is one of the largest and most festive Sundays of the entire year for Christians, and understandably so. Just think of what Jesus' resurrection from the dead declares to us. Look at Romans 1 verse 4. And who the, through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus' resurrection from the dead declares for every generation of people exactly who Jesus is. Jesus is 
the very Son of God, just as he claimed to be. Jesus' resurrection from the dead also shows that what Jesus says is trustworthy and true. Jesus had very specifically and repeatedly said that he was going to die and on the third day come back to life. If Jesus has not risen from the dead, then he cannot be trusted. He is a liar. However, Jesus has done exactly as he promised. Not even death can prevent Jesus from doing what he promises. Jesus is our powerful and faithful Savior. Look at Romans 4 verse 25, which also speaks of Jesus. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This verse once again uses that word justification, which we talked about in our last lesson. Jesus was raised to life for our justification, that is, so that we could be declared not guilty. With Jesus' resurrection, he declared that the full price of our salvation had been paid. God the Father had fully accepted all that Jesus had done with his life and death as the payment for our sins. In a way, Jesus' resurrection is kind of like a receipt from the store that provides proof of purchase. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is our proof of purchase that Jesus has fully paid the price of our salvation. You can take that to the bank. Finally, read the comforting words of Jesus in John chapter 14. Jesus says, Because I live, you also will live. Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead assures us that we too will one day rise bodily from the grave. The lifeless body of the Christian which is placed into the ground or tomb is not the end for that body, but it will one day be raised to life just as Jesus' lifeless body was raised to life. We'll talk more about that final resurrection day in just a moment. You can now see why Easter is such a large celebration for Christians. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the culmination of Jesus' saving work and brings with it powerful promises to us. So where is this Jesus that rose from the dead? What happened to him? Well, Jesus removed his visible presence from this world in an event that we call ascension, literally Jesus going up. When did this going up ascension of Jesus occur and where did he go up to? Read Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Acts chapter 1 was written by a man named Luke, who also wrote the book of the Bible bearing his name and usually called the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke records the life and teachings of Jesus and was initially written to a man named Theophilus. In the book of Acts, Luke includes some additional details about what happened after Jesus' resurrection on Easter morning. Forty days after his resurrection on Easter, Jesus removed his visible presence. Jesus was simply lifted up into the sky. A little over a month after his resurrection, during which time he had further prepared his disciples to go out and proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus the Christ. So why did Jesus choose to remove his visible presence in such a visible way? Well, Jesus wanted to assure his disciples of what he had promised them the night before his death, as is recorded for us in John chapter 14. Jesus said to his disciples, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Did you notice Jesus' promise? Jesus said that he was going to return to heaven to prepare a place for us. Therefore, Jesus' ascension assures us that he is preparing a place for us in heaven just as he said he would. And there is no need to prepare a place for us unless he intends to 
take us to that place, which he does at the end of a Christian's life. Look once again to the words of Acts chapter 1. After he, Jesus, said this, he was taken up before there, the disciples' very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Two angels stood beside the disciples, who were staring up into the sky to deliver a very important message. They wanted those disciples and followers of Jesus of every generation to know that Jesus will return in the same visible way he left on that ascension day. So maybe the next logical question to ask is, what is Jesus doing now that he has ascended into heaven? Well, don't for a minute think that Jesus is kicking back and taking it easy, just waiting around until the end of the world. Not at all. Jesus is busy. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. These are the words that Jesus spoke during his trial before the Jewish ruling council called the Sanhedrin. The Jesus they looked at did not seem all that impressive, although he did claim to be the Son of God. However, they should not be fooled by his appearance. Although humbled at this time, there would be a time in the future when Jesus would once again resume the full use of his divine authority and power pictured as sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, a description of a position of power not a specific location. That is what Jesus is doing right now. As our ascended Lord, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, a position of all power and glory. In that position of authority, what is Jesus doing? Ephesians chapter 1. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Jesus is using all of his power to rule all things for our good. What a comfort and confidence this brings to God's people as they see a world that at times seems to be spinning out of control. We too need to be reminded not to be fooled by the appearance of things. The Lord will use all things, even the hard ones, for our eternal good. We trust and we wait patiently. We started with Jesus' descent into hell, continued to his resurrection from the dead, saw his ascension into heaven, which resulted in him sitting at the right hand of God in that position of all authority and power. But there was one final event included in Jesus' exaltation. While the other events are in the past or present, this one is still in the future. Jesus will judge. Well, we might say that Jesus' judging is something that is also in the past or present in one way, but culminating in a final judgment in the future. To understand what I mean, let's ask a very basic question. What happens when a person dies? Well, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 describes it. The dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. At death, a separation occurs. Our bodies begin to decay and return to the dust from which they came. Our soul, that which makes us us, it is who we are, returns to the Lord. The purpose of that soul returning to the Lord is explained in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. A person only dies once. And afterwards, the soul is immediately judged to determine where it goes. There are no second chances, nor does the Bible teach any type of reincarnation which provides people with endless chances to, quote-unquote, get it right and work their way up to the freedom of some sort of heaven-like. There are only two destinations for every soul at the end of life, and that is either with God in heaven or separated from God in hell. Jesus made that clear with his words in Luke chapter 23, 
that the soul need not wait with the lifeless body for this judgment to take place. Rather, at the moment of death, there is an immediate judgment. Jesus said to the thief who hung beside him on the cross and trusted in the promise of salvation, Jesus offered, Today you will be with me in paradise. He did not say, Someday, or just wait. He said, Today. What a wonderful thought to know that a fellow Christian who dies immediately enjoys the peace and perfections of life eternal with Jesus in heaven. Jesus' words in John chapter 5 verses 28 to 29 describe what awaits that lifeless body from which the soul has departed in death. Jesus says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. The body remains in the grave until Jesus returns, just as Jesus had promised to do at his ascension. So when exactly is this going to happen? When will Jesus return? Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. Remember that this is when Jesus chose to set aside his divine power and glory. And so he could honestly say that he did not know about when the end of the world would be, but that only God, his heavenly Father, would know. The Bible clearly states that only God himself knows when the end of the world will come. Anyone claiming to know when that end of time will be marks himself as a liar and somebody who can certainly not be trusted. All right, so Jesus is coming back. So what are we supposed to do in the meantime? It's been about 2,000 years since Jesus said he was going to come back. How will we know when that time is nearing? Are there any signs that we should expect leading up to Jesus' return? Well, look at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 24 which tell us what we should expect in the time leading up to that return of Jesus at the end of time. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, these will, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Just as road signs remind you of an upcoming exit, so Jesus says there are signs that we should look for that remind us of his pending return. What are those signs of the end? Well, as the world draws close to an end, it will become more and more ungodly. In society, there will be wars, a lack of peace, rumors of wars, general unrest, we might say. In nature, there will be earthquakes and famines. There will be natural disasters. Christians will not be free from the problems either. In fact, there will be problems within Christianity, or what the Bible calls the church. There will be false Christ, that is, people and organizations that claim that there are other ways to salvation other than Jesus. There will be persecution of Christians. The gospel message of Jesus our Savior will be proclaimed throughout the world. What do you notice about all these different signs? Most, if not all of them, have been occurring since the days immediately following Jesus' ascension. The spread of the gospel throughout the world might be the only one that people may say has met its fulfillment only in the 
last century or so. So what do you think is Jesus' point? The point is clear, isn't it? Jesus could return at any time. We just need to be ready for his return, which through faith in Jesus, we are. What will Jesus' return be like? How will Jesus come again? Well, there are some people who claim that Jesus' return will be secretive. That Jesus will secretly and suddenly rapture, literally lift up or away from this world, Christians to heaven, and leave behind the unbelievers to give them a, a second chance. Now, there are many variations of what people may call the rapture, but all of them have to do with Jesus secretly returning multiple times towards the end of the world and taking his believers from this world. However, does this teaching of a rapture coincide with what the Bible teaches about Jesus' return? Look at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. Now, does this sound like something you're going to miss? Jesus is going to return in all of his divine glory, accompanied by his angels. Doesn't sound too secretive to me, does it? Combine that with the clear words of Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Again, Jesus' return will be a visible return, not hidden. It will be for everyone to see. Therefore, the Bible does not teach a rapture of believers before the final judgment. That will take place at the end of time, not before Jesus returns in all of his glory. So what is that day going to be like when Jesus comes again? Let's look to the Bible so that we can know what to expect. We saw this verse earlier as well. Jesus says in John chapter 5, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. When Jesus returns at the end of time, Jesus will raise all people from the dead. The souls that had been enjoying heaven and the souls of those suffering in hell will be united with their lifeless bodies and will live again. What will happen then? Acts chapter 7. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Jesus will judge all people. Now you might be thinking, hold on for a second. I thought that I thought that people were judged when they died in order to determine if they go to heaven or hell. Why does Jesus judge people again? Remember a couple of things. First, there will still be people living when Jesus returns who have not died and faced judgment. Therefore, these people will need to be judged to determine if going to heaven or hell. Second, the judgment that takes place at the time of death is private, only known between God and the individual. On Judgment Day, that private judgment that took place for the person at the time of their death will be a public judgment before Jesus. How glorious to stand with all believers of all time and hear Jesus declare what he has already declared to us personally. Not guilty, worthy of heaven. For those who did not trust in Jesus, what a horrible day. A terrifying day to stand among those who also rejected the salvation Jesus won for them and to hear, away from me. We already touched on this on the previous slide. But don't simply take my word for it. Look at what Jesus says. What will Jesus' verdict be? Jesus says in Mark 16, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. In the complicated and somewhat confusing justice system that we live in, this is so simple, isn't it? Those who trust in Jesus will be saved. Those who do not trust in Jesus will be condemned. You might think, simple? Yes. But how do I know I'm going to be standing on the right side? 
that standing on the right side is the picture that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 25. The picture of a shepherd sorting between the sheep and the goats is how Jesus pictures the judgment between believers and unbelievers. Listen to Jesus' description of Judgment Day in Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. To those who trust in Jesus, to his sheep, his believers, Jesus promises the inheritance of eternal life with him in heaven. This trust in Jesus was active and living and demonstrated throughout these believers' lives as Jesus goes on to say, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will say to him, Lord, when? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Their love for their Savior was evidenced by their love for their fellow man. Yes, faith evidences itself. And as Christians, we naturally want to provide as much evidence as possible for those who belong to our Lord and Savior Jesus. What is eternal life like with Jesus? Well, look at the picture that Revelation 21 verse 4 paints for us. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. All those things that we are so familiar with from life in this sinful world are forever removed. Here are some other aspects of heaven to look forward to. A place of joy that will never get old or boring. A place where we will delight to serve the Lord. No more struggles with a sinful world or our sinful nature that tries to prevent and persuade us from serving the Lord. We will serve God perfectly. The Bible tells us that we will reign with Christ. We will not be menial servants watching as Jesus and a select few others enjoy heaven. No, we will reign with Christ. We will have a different view of previous sufferings fully recognizing how the Lord used even those hard times of our lives to bring us blessings and appreciating them. There will be no more tiredness, which is a result of failing bodies and wearisome work. There will be no more sorrow or sadness, pain or sickness. Finally, there will be no more grief or death. Heaven is absolutely perfect and peaceful in every way. However, remember that there is a separation that takes place on Judgment Day between believer and unbeliever. Jesus says to those on his left who did not trust in him these terrifying words. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment. But the righteous to eternal life. To the unbelievers, to the goats... Those who did not believe in Jesus as their Savior, Jesus will send them away to eternal punishment in hell. The spiritual death and separation from God that all experience by nature will turn into eternal separation from God and His blessings. Because these people did not receive through faith the one who repaired that relationship, Jesus Christ. What is the separation from God called hell like? The Bible paints this terrifying picture. 
complete, unending, internal and external torment. Complete and eternal separation from God. Maybe another way to picture hell is utter hopelessness. Just think, in this life people may have to endure terrible things. But at least we know that we will not they will not last forever. For the Christian there is the certain hope of rescue from this life to life eternal in the joys of heaven. In hell there is no hope for rescue. It is a very real place with never ending separation from God and suffering. Once that public judgment of distinguishing between believer and unbeliever takes place, Jesus has something special planned for that old body. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Who oh, Jesus, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Jesus will give believers a perfect glorified body similar to Christ after his resurrection. What exactly will that body be like? Well, the Bible does not give us specifics as to age, weight, height, or hair color, but nothing to worry about because remember who is giving you this new body. This is Jesus, your Savior. You will certainly not be disappointed. Well, what's going to happen then? There is one last thing for Jesus to do. Look at 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. The whole world and all that is in it, which has been affected by sin, will be destroyed by fire. With the phrase in 2 Peter chapter 3 of, will be laid bare, it has the idea of fire being used to burn away all the impurities. Anything affected by sin will be completely and fully removed. And just a couple of verses later, 2 Peter 3 goes on to say, But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Jesus promises to give his believers a perfect home and a new earth where they will be able to live for eternity with their new glorified bodies with all of their fellow Christians and their Savior God in that ultimate peace and perfection. Now that we know what the Bible tells us about that final day of time called Judgment Day, we have a better understanding of what to expect. Still, I think that there might be some apprehension, and naturally so, because none of us have ever been through Judgment Day before. But Jesus assures us that we have nothing to be afraid of. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke 21. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. These words remind us that while in this world, even as Christians, we're not in heaven yet. Yes, we know that heaven awaits us, but we still have problems and difficulties to endure. We know that we are fully forgiven of our sins, but still struggle daily to fight the temptations to sin. But on Judgment Day, all of that will be over. Christians will finally be able to fully enjoy what Jesus has won for them. So if it's so great, what's taking Jesus so long to return? Listen to the words of 2 Peter chapter 3. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar and the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. In his love, Jesus is patiently waiting for more to come to faith. You probably know someone who if Jesus returned this day would not be ready in faith to meet him and receive the salvation he has won for them. As long as that person is alive, we've got work to do. 
to tell more and more people about Jesus so that whenever Jesus comes back, more people may be ready to welcome him as their Savior. And so we simply end with the prayer that is found in the final chapter of the Bible. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's all for this lesson. Please make sure to complete the review worksheet for this lesson and to read through the second article as a review of what the Bible teaches concerning Jesus. Next time we move on to the work of the third person of the Trinity, the work of God the Holy Spirit.